Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Here I've got an interesting video where we're going to explore what is the same and what is different between the open interval 0, 1 and the closed interval 0, 1. So let's recall what I mean by these two notations real quick. So these are going to be all real numbers between 0 and 1, not including 0 and not including 1. Whereas this closed interval is all points between 0 and 1, including 0 and including 1. So that means 0 is an element of this set, but not this set. 1 is an element of this set, but not this set. But other than that, they have the same number, or they have the same elements, I should say. Okay, so we'll first start off by describing how these sets are very similar to each other. And maybe the biggest similarity is that they have the same number of elements. So they both have an uncountable infinity of elements. But instead of proving that they both have an uncountable infinity of elements of the same cardinality, if you want to get really fancy about it, what we'll do instead is exhibit a one-to-one -one correspondence between the open interval 0, 1 and the closed interval 0, 1. So this is a bit tricky, but the way to think about it is that almost all of the points from this copy of 0, 1 to this copy of 0, 1 will be mapped to themselves. What we'll do is take out a countable infinity of points in the open interval and then kind of shift them a little bit. So we'll take the first term from that sequence and send it to the number 0. We'll take the second term from that sequence and send it to the number 1. And then we'll take all of the other terms and send them to the term that is shifted back by 2 terms, if you will. Okay, so I think like that's a nice kind of graphic of the way to think about it, but maybe we could write down an explicit function where we define the sequence carefully. Okay, so let's do that. So let's start with our open interval 0, 1. So I'll put that here. So let's say this is the number 0 and this is the number 1. And then we'll put our closed interval 0, 1 here. So again, this is going to be the number 0, and this is going to be the number 1. So here we inc include 0 and 1, here we do not include 0 and 1. So what I'll do is take out all of the reciprocals of powers of 2 from this set and use that as my sequence. So let's start here with the number half, so I'll make that yellow. And then my point here will be the number quarter. I'll make that pink. And then so on and so forth. So maybe this one here will be the number eighth. And then the number one sixteenth is like hidden in right here. So everything gets pretty small pretty quickly, but that's okay. And then my map is going to take one half to the number zero. So like that. And then it'll take the number one quarter th to the number one. And then after that, it scales everything back. So it'll take an eighth to the number half, but that's occurring down here. And then it'll take the number sixteenth. Well, it scales back two, so that'll be to the number quarter. But again, that's down here. What happens to like an eighth and a sixteenth and a thirty-second here? Well, let's recall that we have infinitely many terms from our sequence in here that get mapped to the infinitely many terms from our sequence in here. Okay. So the nice thing about doing this for this sequence, which is 1 over 2 to the n, is we can write down the function pretty easily. So let's do that. So we'll define our function. I'll call it f. It goes from the open interval 0, 1 to the closed interval 0, 1. And it'll be defined in the following piecewise manner. So f of x will be equal to x itself, so it's the identity function if x is not equal to 1 over 2 to the n for n equals 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. So for, in other words, for n being a natural number or a positive integer. 
Okay, great. And then our output will be the number zero if x equals one half. And so that's exhibited by this yellow line. Our output will be the number one if x equals one quarter. So that'll be this pink line. And then one over two to the n minus two if x is one of these other reciprocals of powers of two. So let's say one over two to the n, where n is equal to three, four, five, dot, dot, dot. So all natural numbers bigger than or equal to three. Okay, so let's see. Like this interval gets mapped down to this interval, this interval gets mapped down to this interval, and so on and so forth. That's if you're not a reciprocal of a power of two. The number one half, one over two to the one, gets mapped to zero. One over two to the two gets mapped to one. That's this yellow curve and this pink curve, respectively. And then one over two to the n gets mapped to one over two to the n minus two for n bigger than or equal to three. So what I mean by that is, let's see, if n is equal to three, then one over two cubed, in other words, one over eight, gets mapped to one over two to the three minus two, so that's one half. So this would be this one eighth getting mapped to one half. And this is like our full piecewise description of this function. Okay, so just to reiterate what's going on here, our goal is to show how this open interval and this closed interval are similar yet different. And this is maybe how they're the same. They have the same number of elements. In other words, they have the same cardinality. Okay, so now let's see how they're different. So the easiest way to describe the difference between these two sets has to do with what happens when you remove a single point from each set. So let's notice we can remove a point from the closed interval 0, 1, and it still is in one piece. We actually have two choices of points to remove to allow this thing to maintain intactness, if you will. So we could remove the number zero or the number one. So my picture here is what happens if you remove the number one. So if you remove the number one, you still have only one piece to this set. It's just you end up with this half open interval. Okay, but if we remove a single point from the open interval 0, 1, it is now in two pieces. And this is regardless of which point you remove. So let's see what happens here. We've got this open interval 0, 1. We remove some point. Well, it'll be between 0 and 1, and it'll give you this union of open intervals. So we've got this separation between the two sets. So what we'll actually end up showing is that it's impossible to make a continuous bijective function between this closed interval and this open interval. So in other words, they are not homeomorphic. So this uses a couple of ideas from maybe the first bit of a topology course. And in fact, if you're interested in a topology course, I'm going to record a full set of videos for a topology course probably next fall. And that's going to be on my second channel. So if you want to get ahead of that and make sure you're ready, you could like go ahead and subscribe to that second channel. Okay, so we'll do this by way of contradiction. So let's suppose we have a bijective function g from the closed interval to the open interval. So let's just say this is bijective and it's continuous. So check it out. Over here we found a bijective function from the open interval to the closed interval. Well that means its inverse is also a bijective function. So it's possible to have a bijective function. It's also possible to have a continuous function. I'll let you guys think about how you can find a continuous function. But what is not possible is to have a bijective and continuous function. Okay, another thing that we want to do is scale this function g so that g evaluated at 1 is equal to 1 half. So let's maybe explain kind of how we can do this. So we're going to replace g of x with g of x over 2 times g of 1. And notice that means that g evaluated at 1 is equal to 1 half. And we don't really need to do this. It just kind of makes everything work out nicely. Okay, 
But since this G from 0, 1 to 0, 1 is bijective and continuous, so is the restriction, which goes from closed 0 to open 1 to 0, 1 minus 1 half. Okay, so in other words, we've got this restriction G hat which, like I said, goes from the half open interval 0, 1 into the union of intervals 0, half union, half 1. So again, like I said, this is also bijective and continuous. So we won't check that here, but maybe just to talk through it a little bit, it's bijective because we just removed a single point from both sides, and it's continuous because anytime you have a restriction of a continuous function, it is continuous, and that's exactly what we have here. But that's actually going to give us a problem, and that problem comes by looking at the following fact. So now we can take this interval 0, 1 and write it as the pre-image of these two intervals under our function g hat. So we've got g hat inverse, in other words, the inverse image of the interval 0 to half union, the inverse image of the interval 1 half to 1. Great. So what have we done? We've written our set here, 0 to 1, as the union of two open sets. We know they're both open sets because they're, they're the inverse image of open sets. Another thing is that these two open sets are disjoint. So I'll just say that. They're disjoint, and we know that they're disjoint because the function is bijective. In other words, it's one to one and onto. But that means we found a separation for this interval 0, 1, which is a connected set. So that gives us a contradiction. But what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted this possibility of finding a simultaneously bijective and continuous function g from 0, 1 to 0, 1. So that means there is, in fact, no bijective continuous function from this closed interval to this open interval. So again, that's a careful way of saying that the removal of this single point over here produces a connected set, whereas over here it forces a separated set. And that's a good place to stop. If you'd like guided hands-on practice solving problems like the ones that you see on this channel and much more, make sure to check out today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant has wonderful interactive math, science, and computer science courses at all levels. All of their courses are excellently designed to help you develop a true intuitive understanding of the material. For lifelong learners of mathematics, Brilliant can help you at any level, from reviewing basic arithmetic to learning vector calculus or group theory. There's even a contest style preparation course for all of you rising math olympiads out there. As it's the summer travel season, I'd like to report that Brilliant has an excellent mobile app that allows you to solve problems from virtually anywhere. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash Michael Penn or click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. And one more time, I'd like to thank Brilliant for sponsoring today's video.